Morning all. Another interesting game from the evolution of style perspective is Mir Sultan Khan's clash with Aaron Nimzovich. In our evolution of style series, great emphasis has been placed on the hypermodernists and how they impacted the evolution of style. The height of Nimzovich's career was the late 1920s and 30s, and this game was right in 1930 at the Liege tournament. Nimzovich uh, is ranked by chess metrics as the third best player in the world from 1927 to 31, behind Alexander and, 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 and Capablanca. So this game is, is important to look at. Let's have a look at it. D4 from Mir, and Nimzovich plays knight f6, and after c4, e6, maybe Mir was wary of playing Nimzovich in his Nimzo Indian system. So he was wary to play knight c3, allowing bishop b4. He played actually Queen's Indian territory, knight f3. Nimzovich plays b6. We see after g3, a very popular move even in modern times, bishop a6, to encourage this slightly weakening b3 move. And that is played here. There, there are other moves to defend the pawn, but b3 is the one chosen. And we see bishop b4 check, bishop d2. And in modern times, sometimes we see bishop e7 here. If we, in fact, do a reference check here, I think bishop e7 is the most popular move, not minding uh, losing a tempo, because it has caused disruption. Uh, so here, bishop e7 is overwhelmingly played, it seems, in modern times. I have on my local database here 4,421 games with the bishop going back. In this game, the much rarer continuation now, only 164 games, but but Karpov, Short, Ivanik, and Nikolic have played bishop takes d2 here as well. But the, the vastly popular move is retreating the bishop back to e7. So in this game, bishop takes d2 is played by Nimzovich. Knight b takes d2, okay. And white's development is okay, really, it seems, with knight takes b2. It doesn't seem as though there's a major problem. Bishop b7, bishop g2. And now Nimzovich encourages white to commit on the dark squares in some way by playing c5. Possibly white could keep control of dark squares more with the move e3, weakening some light squares. And we'll need to check that out in the second pass. In this game, Mir actually took away from the center. And in some respects, it looks a little bit anti-positional to do this because it's dragging another pawn to the center here which could help in black's central control here of that d4 square in particular but also there's potential dynamism on the b file and a structural attack could occur later with a5 and a4 given that's a backward pawn on a semi open file so after b takes c5 i think this looks as though black is doing quite well out of this particular uh, pawn exchange transaction so what does white gain in return though? Maybe, you know, d file pressure, d6, but is that really going to be an exploitable weakness, d6 and the d file generally? Let's have a look. Both sides castle. And now we see rook e1 for Mir. It seems interested in playing for e4 after queen e7. Actually now we see rook c1, as though there's also some interest in discouraging perhaps d5 because c5 would be a good target. We see instead from the pitch e5, and this looks as though black's getting a bind on that d4 square, which will be useful to put a knight in, but at the moment there's e3. However, this next move by Mir, e4, looks as though he's not too concerned about the d4 square at all. So should he be? If a black knight comes to d4, is black going to increase some sort of positional advantage? He's already got one pawn coming towards the center here, controlling d4, and it's as if Mir is not too concerned here. After knight c6, knight b1, and white perhaps thinks that getting a knight to d5 will be a fine position. d6, knight c3. a5 starting a structural attack. 
So potentially on knight d5, black could take and carry on with a4. So b3 is an underminable target here. Knight d2, keeping an eye for the moment on the a4 square of the knight, but allowing black a seemingly aggressive knight post on d4 now. Knight f1, trying to reroute perhaps the d5. Bishop c6, as though the structural attack will carry on, and black doesn't mind giving up the light square bishop here. Knight e3. Queen b7, attacking e4, putting a lot of pressure on that e4. For the moment, delaying any a4 intention. Queen d3. And now in this position, Aaron Nimsovich does play a4. He's trying to introduce some structural damage. B takes a4, bishop takes a4, not minding giving up the bishop here. But Mir is just wanting to use the b file, rook b1, queen a7. And now we see the move rook b2, as though the intention is potentially to double and try and use the seventh rank. Now, the bishop does have the option of retreating back, and it does go back to protect b7, as well as put pressure on e4 again. Rook e b1. Does white's dynamism count more than black's fine looking pieces here? This knight on d4 especially looks quite impressive in this position. Queen c7. The queen is attacked. Queen d7. Knight d1. Is the idea to play knight c3? Knight e8. Knight c3, yes. So it looks as though for the moment as though both sides are doing okay in their own way. Nizvich's next move, g6, is very interesting. As though there's an intention at some point maybe to play f5, or maybe even knight g7 to prepare f5. Try and put pressure on this diagonal and the center generally. Mir takes on d4 here though now. So we see things simplifying a little bit. c takes d4, gives black an important square potentially. Black still has a knight which might be entrenched on c5 later. White well, has to be wary about keeping a bishop on the same colour as his pawns and going into a potentially bad endgame. After knight d5, it is possible here, for example, for black to consider bishop takes d5, but here perhaps white will either extend the bishop like this or try and use that c file with c takes d5. For the moment, Stimswich is not too concerned about the knight. He plays actually queen a7. But now, after the, this next move, it looks a little bit dodgy. g4. Sometimes, Mir in his games is moving pawns on the king side with sometimes a little bit of over optimism. And here, perhaps, that's such a case because he's slightly weakening his position further on the dark squares in particular with the move g4. In other games he's had a lot of pieces around the king side to more justify this kind of advance on the king side, but here perhaps he was concerned about black playing f5 and was trying to prevent that. But black doesn't have to just play for f5. This which takes on d5 here. White takes with the e pawn. And now we see knight f6 hitting g4, but it also gives the knight a nice blockading maneuver on this key dark square, c5. After h3, there's no rush to play knight d7, especially as it seems to lose a piece nearly to rook b7, but there's queen a4, but still, Nizovich plays king g7 here. We see rook b6 attacking d6, that's defended. Rook 1 to b2. Now h6. Is black getting a greater dark square grip? Mir lashes out now with f4, trying to undermine black's construction in the center. Knight d7 attacking the rook. And offering the d6 pawn. Can it actually be taken here in this position? Perhaps not. We need to check this out in the second pass. 
or perhaps we can just see that knight c5 is pretty dangerous in any case. Knight c5 attacks the queen and also activates the rook on d6. So that's to be avoided. So in this position actually after f4 knight d7 the rook goes back. Now interestingly Aaron Nimsovic, he takes on f4 here, giving the knight another juicy square, the e5 square potentially. But what about the weak d pawn now? It's been slightly weakened. The structure's been undermined. We see rook d2, knight e5. The queen's now come off, and Nimsovic is getting potentially a rook on the 7th, but first he plays f3, bishop f1. Now in this position, actually he doesn't play rook takes a2, which seems to be the most obvious move to play here. Instead, he's perhaps concerned about the move c5 here. His next move pins that pawn down, and in fact gives white the opportunity to protect a2. And now we see knight d7, the knight is heading for c5. But look at this structure with the bishop. The bishop is on the same colour as the pawns here. Is white being outplayed with the advent of this knight coming to c5? King f2, rook a3. Is white going to be material up though after rook b3? Will this blockade on the dark squares count as much as a tangible pawn here? Rook d a8. And white is going to be now a pawn up. Rook takes f3. Okay. Can Nimzovic just take on a2 here? Instead, he plays knight c5. Not recapturing immediately. Instead, threatening now knight e4, menacing. Check. He could have taken on a2 to get his material back, but knight c5 instead. Very interesting decision. Trying to maybe reduce white's counterplay. White takes the opportunity to protect the pawn by taking off a pair of rooks. So the pawn's protected. So he's a pawn up here, but does black stand better? It looks as though this is a very lovely blockade on c5. This bishop's hemmed in by its own pawns. This rook is very aggressive. And this king's prospects of coming into the game on the dark squares, just walking on the dark squares, seems quite good here. King g2, and we see f5, which provides a shield for the black king to walk in to white's position. g takes, g takes, king g1, and the king starts walking in. So, okay, and this is also now a dangerous pass pawn. With this pawn blockaded, and this pawn blockaded, is white really a pawn up, or is that a visual illusion? A materialistic illusion, because black seems to have the dangerous pass pawn here, the more aggressive king prospects, and beautiful dark square blockades. Rook b2, f4. White is waiting passively. What can white do? This pawn's coming at him, and his pieces are pretty dead in the water here. Rook e2, king f5. The rook finally ventures out into black's position, but f3 is very dangerous now. Black is potentially threatening. Now knight e4, and at some point f2 check, perhaps. Rook h8. The king comes to protect for a moment. Rook d8. Now finally, Nimzovic snaps that pawn on a2, not minding losing d6 in exchange. And now gets in knight e4 with tempo. So if he wants f2, he's attacking the rook as well. Looks pretty dangerous. Mir tries h4 check after king f4. The king's walking in, visiting his king. Rook d8, rook a1. Now threatening concrete things like knight d2 and knight g3. The horrible pin. Rook g8, knight g3. Mir is helpless. He's losing material here. If he takes even the exchange, there's still f2 check, winning the bishop after. So he's losing the bishop here. He tries king h2, off the takes. It's pretty helpless. Knight e3, 
crash thing. Mate, check. Knight f5. After rook takes f5, which is hopeless. King takes f5. Mir resigns. Nimzovic was a very, very powerful player. But in this Liege tournament, it should be noted that Mir did finish ahead of Nimzovic overall. Many of Mir Sutton Khan's games were absolutely decisive, very few draws. So let's have a look now from Black's perspective. So it seems Nimzovic, as well as the Nimzo Indian, was prepared in Queen's Indian territory pretty well. The old fashion move shall we call it in this Queen's Indian variation of Bishop takes d2 was used so Bishop e7 nowadays is the move which is more popularly played just to cause disruption with that check but here Bishop takes d2 statistically actually let's check this on reference statistically actually Queen takes d2 is 109 games compared to Knight 1 takes d2 is 55 so it's almost double play queen takes d2 here and Anne Karpov, girlfriend Van really have tried queen takes d2 knight, knight takes d2 has been played by Anderson Stephenson and some other players Furman, Garcia, Illenden but queen takes d2 is the popular move uh, about double the popularity so we see bishop b7 now which I think looks like a fairly logical move and it is the move played by Short and Rhoda in this position Bishop b7 the most popular move and so we have here a position which let's check technically really I suspect that this d takes c5 must have given black or here blacks almost kind of equal in any case if we look from an engine point of view it seems but after c5 okay white played d takes c5 if you play something like e3 is that a big problem it seems black's doing fine the engine actually prefers looking at a dynamic temporary pawn sack actually queen c2 so what's going on here c takes d and then just taking the pawn soon if black tries to defend here the pawn Knight takes e5 using that pin. So, this would be an interesting temporary pawn sacrifice idea. Computer generated idea, that'll be it. So, anyway, in the game, d takes c5 seems a little bit of a positional compromise because it is dragging one of black's pawns to the center con to help control d4. And we saw that d4 control transforms into a knight on d4 and then using c5 later and even e5 so black seems to get a good dark square grip out of this central control queen e7 and we see now e5 from them so which actually technically looks a little bit suspect from an engine point of view if you look at the evaluation here why is e5 a little bit suspect let's have a look at this dynamic move knight g5 hitting the bishop what will black play here if black plays knight c6 Knight D E four on D six, Knight E eight, Queen D three. White's dynamism on the D file is great to celebrate. And now actually, there's some problems here. Perhaps a natural move like H six fells. There's some problems here emerging like this. Whoops, <laughs> this sort of thing is is pretty dangerous. So there's always dynamic possibilities in chess behind the scenes. And it seems you know technically e5 might be a little bit suspect to knight g5, believe it or not. And if bishop takes g2, white should be okay. The the light squares in black's position are a little bit suspect here. So anyway, in the game, after e5, white played e4, which looks fairly suspect. It's not using the light squares much. For white now compared to the more dynamic looking knight g5. The bishop's potentially being hemmed in by its own pawns to leave potentially a bad endgame scenario. Knight c6 and we see black more than fine here 
it seems, especially after this knight d4 occurs, playing slightly better. White's getting slightly outplayed positionally. Bishop c6, knight e3. One thing to note in the interest of object objectivity and the most aggressive, uh, effective style, the style which overshadowed most other players of this time, is Alex Alexander Anakin with the white pieces was a really dangerous opponent for both of these two players. And perhaps we should check out some some games. Uh, we have checked out one loss of Dimzovich to Alakine, but we haven't checked out any losses of Mir Sultan Khan to Alakine. From a stylistic perspective, well, it seems Alakine was the lion in the jungle of the time, really. Uh, but we'll see. In maybe later in the series. Here black is doing very well though. The positional player meeting the positional player here. And Mir is positioning. Um, getting undermined. His structure is undermined here. B takes a4. Bishop takes a4. Should white have tried knight a4? Well it still leaves these, these weaknesses. c4 and a2 are weak. If we, if we have this situation white's really passive. Black's just going to build up pressure naturally. On the A file and even Queen A6 later, perhaps. So it's an unpleasant position here, but uh, Mir tries to make use of that um, B file with his rooks, but uh, they're fairly ineffectual at the moment. Black just stands better. This this is a curious idea. G6 slightly offering volunteering dark square weaknesses to play G6. Could white have tapped into that at all? Better than the game. F4 in this position is mentioned. F4. So that leverages the knight on b5 because if it takes, we can play knight takes d4 or g takes f4. But um, what would black do here? It seems this this would be a logical move in response to g6. If we continue, say with f5. E takes away from the center again. Bishop takes. Queen takes. Takes. White should be okay here objectively. Maybe f4 was a good move to try and undermine black center in this position. This next move instead, knight takes d4, is fairly committal and maybe consolidates to some extent black's advantage to make it more solid. Temporary advantages. C takes d4 is giving black potentially the c5 square. The knight d5, an option is just simply here just to take on d5. This looks more sophisticated. Queen a7. Both of these moves apparently they're liked here from an engine point of view. Now g4 doesn't, it looks suspect. Is black really, what is black's actual threat here? Bishop takes. And then queen c5, dark square blockade is apparently. If black was given another move, uh, so g4, and now bishop takes d5 anyway. It's only really helped black's dark square strategy. Surely playing g4 slightly weakened white's position. Knight f6, h3. King g7, black stands better. It seems. The dark square grip is evident. Rook b6, rook fd8. Okay, and we see now h6, f4, knight d7. Now let's check this out. This doesn't seem to be, it seems to be the engine doesn't mind this continuation with knight c5. So, what is actually going on here after rook takes d6? Knight c5, I would have assumed was winning the rook. But it's not so clear. This is why we need to check with engines for objectivity and, and the true dynamicness of the positions rather than the superficial human eye that in this position it's not losing the rook. There's queen e2. This is, this is amazing. Because now if takes, we have check. And if rook f6, there's g5. So white would be winning the rook back with this queen e2. 
but still better for black. Black doesn't have to take here. E4. And these pawns are swamping white in the center. If it takes here, this is very dangerous. If bishop takes rook e8, it's very, very dangerous for white, losing for white. So it's bad anyway to take on d6, even with this dynamic resource. So we see rook 6 to b5. And Nimzovich correctly, it seems, takes on f4. This is really light. It gives the knight e5. If if one is white actually threatening, if given another move, maybe f5 is on the cards for whatever impact that will have on black's king side or rook f2. So by taking the attacks kind of gone here, black's given that huge e5 square for the knight. Okay, it doesn't matter about um, the temporary being temporary material down. Kublak really, well, he wants to save this pawn first, but in this position, why not the simple rook takes a2? This looks like a more sophisticated move, rook a4, but why not just rook takes a4, a2? Was c5 really that powerful? Let's have a look. c5. Black can just take. Okay, white's got a pass pawn here, but it is a big deal. It can be blockaded. Rook d6. And what does black actually look forward to here after this blockade? Let's see, a threat analysis. Just king f6. King f6. And then, okay, there's, it looks as though it's just, just better for black, this, this position. This pawn's safe. So this is this is a more uh, sophisticated, luxurious way of playing it to play rook a4. Black's still better, so he, he just was wary about c5. Perhaps technically it's it's not an issue uh, to get this past pawn, but um, okay, rook d2, knight d7, and he, black doesn't mind going a pawn down here. To rook a3 is only temporarily protecting the pawn. He's off to rook b3. Okay, he's going down a pawn. Is there enough compensation? He could have taken on a2 in any case here. Instead, Nimzovich chooses knight c5. If he takes on a2, is it enough to win? It's slightly better for black. It looks as though it's a, it's a a position where, again, this this bishop's hemmed in, but the king seems more active than the game here. In in this game continuation, we see the king, after knight c5, was cut off from the third rank. And maybe that's one of the points about not taking on a2, that knight e4 is a serious threat, and the king is very passive, and this king is having an adventure. So after rook takes a3, rook takes a3, black, although a pawn down, Better king prospects, better knight versus bishop. All the pressure's on white. White's pieces are kind of stuck. With these two blockades in, in place on the deep on the C pawn and the A pawn, black is the one with the past pawn, paradoxically. So King G two, this past F pawn is very, very dangerous here, as well as the king simply walking in. The white king just stuck as well, just waiting. So black is just improving the position, just gradually. And remorselessly going up that mountain of improving the position. And white is just in trouble, it seems. So rook takes a2. Although here, curiously, it doesn't seem like such a big deal. Uh, so was there a blunder which made it worse here after knight e4? Especially when we see 0, zero, zero here. Because you think visually hasn't black got everything the more aggressive king the more aggressive knight versus bishop rook on the seventh isn't every single trump card in black's favor why would rook e6 interfere rook takes h6 let's have a quick look black's still better here it's these pawns that might help white in this variation So this could have could have been a bit sharper than the game. These pawns are quite a menace, actually. 
this this looks like a very technical variation, much scarier than the game continuation. Okay, knight. There's a mating net with knight g3 threatened, and the pawns are okay, just about stopped. Maybe, maybe okay. So for white to have better chances in this position, it seems rook e6 and try and get these pawns going as quickly as possible. Mir chose h4 check, which I guess doesn't help uh, with these pawns at all. King f4, and there's also other mating nets on the cards now. So this looks pretty grim now for white. White's losing that bishop much quick, more quickly than perhaps needed, and it's all over. Okay, okay, you may be surprised about this interruption showing a, a miss on Carl Loss, but this is the one game that's on chess games come against Aaron Nimsbich, the leading hypermodernist of the time, and in 1930. At, at the sort of peak of his powers, very interesting positionally to see how a positional player can reduce the counter play of another positional player. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.